Hello and welcome back to An Old Man Watches. Today I'm going to be talking about the Waifu martial arts one-two punch of Once Upon a Time in China 2 and 3, uh, both of which were technically released in 1992. Uh, and in the first of the two films, our hero, Wong Fei Hung, is travelling by train to Canton, where he plans to attend a medical symposium. However, the situation in Canton is rather chaotic. You see, the first Sino-Japanese war has just ended in a humiliating defeat for China's ruling Qin dynasty. And there's immense public outrage within the country at the punitive peace treaty that China must endure. Protests about the treaty, led by the xenophobic White Lotus sect, continually rack Canton. Uh, Wang Feihung first encounters the White Lotus when the sect attacks the symposium he is attending. Uh, despite his great martial arts skills, he initially prefers to avoid conflict. But when the sect attack, to attack a school, he feels compelled to protect the children. Uh, of course, simply averting one attack isn't enough to make sure the kids stay safe, and our hero must now navigate his way through a complex tangle of rival revolutionaries and squabbling officials, both Chinese and foreign. It won't always be easy to tell his allies from his enemies, and he'll need every last one of his kung fu skills to stay alive. Part 3, meanwhile, also begins with Wong Fei Hung on a train journey, uh, but this time it is to Beijing, where Wong plans to introduce his fiance to his father. Of course, once Wong gets the city, he once more stumbles into much bigger things. Uh, it seems there's a lion dance competition that is causing lots of infighting among rival troops and factions within the local community, and which is also being used as a cover for a secret plot to assassinate the Chinese statesman Li Zong Hong Zhang. Only by joining the competition can Wong Fei Hung be in the right place to use his skills to protect the future of China. So after the success of the first Once Upon a Time in China, it was probably inevitable that sequels would follow, and in fact it didn't take long at all. Part 2 hit Hong Kong cinemas only 8 months after the first film, with Part 3 following 10 months after that, though the latter movie actually saw an even earlier debut in Taiwan, which is why they're both listed as 1992 releases on this video and on IMDb. Both films enjoyed commercial success with similar domestic box receipts to the first. Part 3, however, was not so well received from a crit critical perspective. Uh, the original film and Part 2 both enjoyed eight or nine nominations at the annual Hong Kong Film Awards, including for both Best Film and Best Director, and both of those movies successfully claimed the award for Best Action Choreography. That's a pretty important award for a martial arts film, I think. Uh, given that action is such a primary law of such fare. In comparison, Part 3 managed only one nomination for film editing, and it didn't even win that. But are the movies worth seeking out some 30 years later? I think the answer to that will depend on how heavily you weigh a couple of factors. First off, uh, if you're the target audience for extravagant waifu action, these films will absolutely hit the mark for you. They're both packed with numerous fight scenes that boast intricate choreography, and a lot of attention has been paid to giving each such scene its own defining elements and characteristics. Both films frequently vary the weapons employed, the locations in which the fights take place, the role of the surrounding terrain in the combat, and so forth. If anything, I think the third film might be slightly the more inventive in this regard, perhaps because by the time they got to it, all of the more obvious scenarios had already been used. Uh, part 3 features some impressive sequences that combine lion dancing with martial arts fights, as the characters use the cover of the competition to settle their disputes. Uh, and there's also another scene where Wong must do battle while wearing shoes that have been coated with grease. Uh, this simple device allows a major shift in the style of the choreography, with the movie embracing the opportunity for something more in the kind of frantic semi-slapstick style you might expect of a Jackie Chan fight scene, rather than the more dramatically intense style generally used in these movies. The production team behind the Once Upon a Time in China movies, headed by renowned director Sui Hak, uh, have a very clear idea of what draws audiences to these movies, uh, and they've pulled out all the stops to deliver on that content. Now, I had three reservations about the original Once Upon a Time in China. Uh, there was some comedy I didn't find funny, some unpleasant sexual violence, and at 134 minutes in length, I thought the film was just a little bit too long. I'm pleased to say that all three of these reservations were largely addressed in these two offerings. Both films do still offer comedic sequences, not all of which work, but for my taste at least, the hit-to-miss ratio is better. Alas, part two does have its main miss right up at the front of the movie, with multiple comedic efforts on the train trip, which failed to elicit even a smile from me. 
Once I was past that, though, there weren't any points where I was rolling my eyes at the attempted jokes. Indeed, some sequences, such as the aforementioned Greasy Shoes fight in Part 3, definitely entertained. I'm pleased to say that the sexual violence was also gone, replaced with a greater focus on the evolving romance between Wong Fei Hung and 13th Aunt, the younger sister of his stepmother. Although they are not related by blood, the traditions of the time would not permit a relationship between them, and Wong spends a considerable effort resisting his attraction to the woman who is nominally his aunt, even though she's younger than he is. While she, a supporter of Chinese traditions when she believes them well-founded, is more open to the idea. Uh, it's very much a slow burn romance running through both of these movies, particularly part three. And finally, both films are under two hours in length, uh, a leaner runtime that I definitely appreciated, not least because even at 20 to 30 minutes shorter than the original film, they can still sometimes get a little bit exhausting. Uh, ironically, despite it being the shorter of the two, I found this a much bigger problem in part three than in part two. The third film is pretty much all action scenes, pausing only briefly for the welcome respite of the romantic subplot. Now, to reiterate, the action sequences are inventive, varied and well-staged, and these are martial arts movies. After all, you're going to expect a lot of fight scenes. But for my tastes in part three, there are simply too many fight scenes, each lasting a little bit too long with too little happening in between them. There was no sense of the film ever really changing gears or taking a breath. And as a consequence, no opportunity for it to actually build anticipation for the next bout of spectacular stunt work. I think the movie would profit by losing a fight or two and having some other material to give the individual bouts more separation and uh, identity. On the subject of the franchise overdoing it, uh, Once Upon a China, a Time in China would churn out two more films in quick succession, despite the departure of leading man Jet Li. Uh, the fifth film, released in 1994, appears to have been the exhaustion point for audiences. Uh, it took less than one-fifth of the box office receipts of each of the first three films. Uh, and the series moved to TV for a couple of years before finally ending when uh, Jet Li returned for the successful sixth movie, which is often known as Once Upon a Time in China and America. Now, if you're a hardcore wirefu aficionado, these movies are going to deliver. You're going to, ple you're going to be pleased. You should probably see them. If you're not, and you just want to dip your toe in the genre, I recommend Once Upon a Time in China. I feel that it avoids almost all of the flaws of the first film, and it has not yet introduced any new flaws of its own. Next time, Bueller, Bueller. It's John Hughes' 1986 teen comedy, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. That is next time. Until then, thanks for watching this video, and I hope you enjoyed it.